Well, during last week's uh, service where we celebrated Sam and Celia and Sam was moving, he's moving on and got married last, uh, got married on Friday and so he's uh, on his honeymoon and living life. Actually, he's in Vietnam of all places. I mean, where else would you want to be other than Vietnam? I don't think he's going to be doing any missionary work over there this week, but uh, he's, he's, uh, he, last week he invited people forward for prayer when he shared his message, and he invited business leaders, business owners, uh, people who are leaders of uh, organisations um, to come forward for prayer uh, in response to his message, which was about the Sabbath. And as, as that was being, as the invitation was being made to the church, I feel like God just put something on my heart for today, for this service. And I felt strongly last week to speak to our church in this series on Sabbath about God's divine order for leadership. Because, you know, you might think, oh, well, I'm not necessarily, <clears throat> pardon me, a leader, but I, mean, I partly want to just upset that my idea that you have because, you know, if you're a parent, grandparent, if you're a sibling, uh, even if you're an employee, you're setting an example, you're modelling something. So you are leading in some area or sphere or way in your life. Maybe you didn't know it. Well, hello, I'm letting you know you are a leader. But I also felt like that there was a, a leadership, just watching those people respond last week, God was showing me there's a, there's a leadership gifting uh, that is it's on the life of the people within the life of our church. I just felt like that was something that God just put on, on my heart for us, that you, know, you might think, oh, well, look, I'm not sure that you know, God's really called me to lead anything. Well, as I said, I think you already are leading and probably have, don't realise that yet. Or if you are in a space of leadership, I want you to feel as though God sees your leadership and he, he, wants, to, he wants to impart something of, of his supernatural gift of leadership in your life for what you're leading. And so there's a, there's a difference. What I want to talk about this morning, there's a difference between kingdom leadership and secular business leadership. Now, and often the world tries to tell us that, you know, as the church, we can lead like the world leads and we can be as effective and efficient and we can do as well as the world leads the world. But I feel like the kingdom has something more to offer than the way that the world wants to have itself led. And so, you know, when we look at the Bible, we, we do see that there's a difference in the leadership styles. You know, worldly leadership and worldly success is all about doing before being. I was talking to my friend Gary out on the front uh, footpath this morning, and I'm a bit of a doer before being kind of person. Uh, I like to just go around and get all the jobs done, finish all the work, and then be. And then, ah, oh, yes, I can just relax now, all the work is done. You know, but, but kingdom leadership is being. Before doing, we are who we are in God. We don't have to earn a place uh, in His good graces because His grace is for us, not earned by us. Our kingdom leadership is about being with God before doing for God. Worldly success and leadership is about external achievements, what can be seen on the outside, but kingdom leadership is about deep personal transformation. Worldly success and worldly leadership is about financial prosperity. But the kingdom leadership and success is about faithfully tithing, kingdom principles, living a life of generosity. Worldly success is popularity and fame. Kingdom leadership is emotional and spiritual health. Worldly leadership is quantity of accomplishments. How much, how many, how far, how high, how long. But kingdom leadership is quality of relationships. Worldly leadership is being served. Kingdom leadership is serving others. Worldly leadership is about personal advancement. Kingdom leadership is about spiritual maturity. It's competitiveness versus integrity. It's constant busyness versus slowing down, being with God, taking a weekly day of rest to delight in and be with God. It's King, uh, worldly success is pushing ourselves beyond our limitations, where kingdom leadership is embracing our God-given limits. Avoid pain. Grieve well. Attract large crowds. Make mature disciples. It's starkly different. But... Even if we own those principles, even if we feel like they resonate with us because we're faith-filled, Bible-believing, kingdom-loving Christians, today these kingdom leadership principles are harder than ever to faithfully pursue because we're leading our families, mums and dads. 
We're leading our businesses, business owners. We're, living our minist- we're leading our ministries, pastors and ministry leaders through an era that's marked with unprecedented challenges. We've just come off the back of a one in 100 year global pandemic. Anyone in the room older than 100 to remember the last one? A few of you nearly put your hand up then. It's like, I know you're old, but you're not that old. Rapid <laughs> things like that's right. Uh, the economic instability that our world is seeing right now, rapid technological advancements, and profound social and cultural shifts. And so, God, I believe, has brought me here in this moment with us today in this room and those of us who will join us online later or listen back to to pose three questions about leadership as we go through this series on rest and feasting. Three questions. I want to ask three questions. I'm not going to give you three points. I want to ask you three questions. Here's the first one. What is the most critical ability a leader must possess at this moment in history? What is the most critical ability... A leader must possess at this moment in history. Now, you take your time. Think about this. Maybe write it down. What do you think the answer to that question might be? And I would suggest that the most critical aspect of leadership in our world today is this, and it's the title of the message this morning. It's the superpower of self-leadership. It's the superpower of self-leadership. The most critical leadership lesson to master is the leadership lesson of leading you. You like to let yourself get away with a lot of stuff. Well, that's going to change after today. <laughs> yourself thinking, oh no, don't listen to him. And then you're thinking, how can I have that conversation with myself? Think about that. That's meta. Do you like that, Chris? <laughs> leading yourself. 1 Corinthians, this is, this is what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says this. It says, Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. He's trying to change some attitudes in the church. And he says to them, hey guys, you should imitate me. In other words, I want to be your leader. You should imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's what Paul's saying to the church. It's what we would hope we would be able to say to each other. As I am like Jesus, be like me. I want to help you go where God's called you to go. So I'm going there with you. Come on with me. I want to lead you with me to where I'm going to be just like Jesus. Being a Christian leader in your family, in your workplace, in your school, in your university, anywhere in your life, your friendship circles is first about being a follower of Jesus. And your first follower, once you are following Jesus... And if you aren't a follower of Jesus, then later on I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus for the first time and align your life and begin to follow him in his footsteps. But if you are a follower of Jesus, the first person that you are going to need to lead is you. You are the first person that you lead in your leadership world. And if you're not qualified to lead yourself well, you shouldn't really expect to have an opportunity to lead anybody else. If you're not qualified to lead your own life well, you are disqualified from leading others. I'll say that again. If you're not qualified to lead your own life well, then you are disqualified from leading others. And so too often, and many of you will have observed this as well, I have observed not just pastors, but pastors, leaders, parents, whose lives were in complete disarray. And instead of addressing and attending to the matters of their heart, that would lead others to that same place that they're in. So I believe the answer to the first question, what's the most critical leadership lesson to master in this day, in this age, it is the superpower of leading ourselves. So here's my second question. How do I know if I'm leading my own life well? Because sometimes, like I just had a conversation with myself before, we can have the blinkers on. We can be like, I'm doing really well, you know, as we walk ourselves off the proverbial you know, leadership cliff. So how do we know that we're leading our own lives well? Well, it's a good question. I've just had a new thought come to mind. It's not in my notes. Should I say it? Mm, okay. So, <laughs> so uh, there is a way to know this. I'll get to, I'll get to my notes in a second. But you know, one easy way to know if you're leading your own life well, 
I mean, you have to be humble for starters. That's, that's the baseline. Humility is a big one, big part of this. But you have to be willing to receive feedback. Who have you asked recently? How do you think I am leading my family? People sometimes don't want to tell you the truth, but beyond church, you have permission to tell each other the truth. <laughs> that could upset some people, couldn't it? Well, actually, I think maybe you could do this or you could do that. Well, hey, this could be messy, messy church. How do I know if I'm leading my own life well? Maybe ask the question and be okay when people tell you there's things that need to change. But in spite of that, you can also know how well you're leading your own life in any area, workplace, business, family, because culture is the litmus test for the leader. Culture is the ultimate litmus test for the leader because culture simply reveals The heart of the leader. Now, this is a hard pill to swallow, but it's the truth. And it can be a gift if you can allow yourself to see it and be humble enough to receive it. For example, a home that is chaotic, a home that is disordered, is usually led by parents who are chaotic and shambolic and disordered. A workplace that is messy, a workplace that is... If you've got a boss, this could be me, I could be speaking about myself. If you've got a boss... And in your workplace, or maybe in your school, or in your church, there's, there's a hypersensitivity around, where you've got to walk around on eggshells. Everyone's just a little bit careful around the boss. That's usually got nothing to do with the people who are working for the boss. It's got everything to do with the boss being insecure, dictatorial, volatile, and that volatility bleeds out into the culture of the environment they occupy, and that is a reflection on their inner world. Culture is a great litmus test of the leaders in a world. And so when things aren't how we want them to be in our families, in our workplaces, in our business, we have a responsibility to change ourselves. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 12. This is Jesus, verse 35. It says this, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. A good school, a good workplace, a good family is being produced because it's led by a good father and a good mother and and, and a good principal and a good CEO. However, (laughs) an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. If you're leading a business, if you're leading a workplace, if you're leading a family, if you're looked up to in your friendship circles as one of influence and all around you is chaotic, shambolic, disastrous. Let's look inside before we start to change the world around us. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Proverbs 10 verse 11 says, The words of the godly are life-giving fountain. What a great promise that the words of the godly, your words can be a life-giving fountain. But there's also a warning that the words of the wicked conceal violent intentions. So from whatever's going on in our heart has an impact on what happens in our world. And so that's my second question. How do we know if we're leading well? Well, really, we just need to take a look. That should challenge us. That's good. That should challenge us. Third question. If we know that how we lead our lives and how we attend to matters of the heart determines the culture and the quality and the health of our teams, our ministries, our churches, our families, our businesses, then here's my final question, question three. What are the kingdom leadership principles that we must apply to our lives to lead our lives well? Now, in this series on rest and feasting, we have talked quite practically about a lot of kingdom principles, and I'm going to do it again this morning, because I, I, I know that in our current climate, in our current environment, in, our, in the world that we're in, with those, with those tensions I mentioned earlier, with, with, with you know, rapidly changing technological advancements, um, you know, coming off the back of a one in 100 year pandemic, which has changed you know, the social and, social and cultural order of so much of our life, that, that there's, there's a season for that, that, and, and an opportunity for us as leaders to, to rise up to be the kind of kingdom leaders that, that we've been called to be to see change in our world. But I don't just want to leave us with that great idea that, that things can change if we just lead like Jesus. I want to give us more than that. I want us to dial into some, some really practical things that actually move the needle in your life. 
So that, so for me, they fall in, into three um, kind of categories. And if you take notes, now's a good time to get your pen and pencil out. If you don't take notes, I guess you can watch this back later and write it down then. But if you want to see some things change, I believe that these three categories can make all the difference in our lives. And they are daily disciplines, weekly commitments, and seasonal milestones. Daily disciplines, weekly commitments, and seasonal milestones. Number one, daily disciplines. These things make a difference. Underneath this idea of daily disciplines, I've got these three, these four areas that really should be attended to. The first one is this: our physical bodies. You know, in one Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen to twenty, it says that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So sometimes we're quite okay to come into church and attend to the temple of God here at church and vacuum the floor, you know, clean the toilets, um, you know, prepare the table, turn on the air conditioner, get the environment of the physical room just right while neglecting the real temple of the Holy Spirit, our own bodies. I wonder if it's, it could be just as simple as going for a, a daily walk, being outside if that's what you like, going for a run or maybe doing some kind of exercise if you like that kind of thing. We attend to our body as a reflection of how we honour God because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, our physical world, our emotional world. Uh, as a church, we've preached before about the idea of words to live by from Life Church in the US, pastored by Craig Groeschel. You can find that online. But it's, a, it's, a tr- it's the transformative power of declaring biblical truths over our life every single day to help shape our identity, our thinking, And it helps guide our actions to be actions that are full of faith and purpose as opposed to just living in an emotional world that is a roller coaster of up and down because we're being bartered by messages from outside of our world that are trying to pull us off track and pull us down and discourage us and distract us. But here we have an opportunity every day to declare God's Word over our life. Physical health, emotional health, our spiritual health. You know, are we daily connecting with the Word of God? We don't need to read the Bible in a year, but are we just reading the one verse, one Bible verse, word of the day, uh, verse of the day? You know, what was the verse of today? Today it was about the Sabbath rest, wasn't it? Oh, on the U Version Bible app, the Sabbath rest. That's right. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, then, spiritual life. Are we praying? And our relational life. How we are with each other every day. Are we accountable to somebody every day for for meaningful relationship connection? And the Bible says that a man or a person who isolates himself rages against all sound judgment, or all, all, all wise counsel. So don't be alone. Be with people every day. Daily disciplines, weekly commitments. This second category, weekly commitments. Now this stuff matters. Weekly commitments. What are we doing every week to lead well from the inside out? Well, the first thing I can encourage us to do, and you have all made the decision today to do it, and that's to be in church, to be in Christian community. I mean, I, in my experience, and now that I'm getting older, I feel like I've got more authority to say this kind of thing. But the people I observe who are the most biblically kingdom-minded successful are people that prioritise church. They're in church. They're contributing to church. They're sacrificing. They're serving. Weekly commitments. Church, small groups, life groups, our life groups at Beyond Church, we say, are your lifeboat. It's an area of personal accountability. You can let people know how you're going, where you're struggling, and vice versa. You can be a support and a sounding board for others. Church, small groups, your own personal time. What are you doing to be emotionally filling your tank? You know, taking some time off for restoration, with either with yourself or with friends and family? Are you someone who's fun to be around? Are you a leader who people like to be led by? Or are you a leader who just tells people to do stuff and they do it, they're told because they'll think if they don't, they're going to lose their job. Spending a, once a week just enjoying life is going to make you a nice person, a kind person, a fun person. And people want to be led by people who are just good, kind people. So don't be too stuck up. Church, small groups, personal time and Sabbath. Sabbath. As I've said before, God can do more with six days given to Him than you can do with seven kept to yourself. The Sabbath isn't a rule to follow. It's a gift to be received. It's not a rule to follow. A day off a week is not a rule to follow. Being in church and having time with God, intimacy with God is not a rule to follow. It's a gift to be received and it's a gift we decline at our own peril. 
I don't want to have to you know, get to heaven. And God was like, you did great work, mate, but look what could have happened. Look where you could have been. Look what you could have done if you only had have done less, <laughs> if you only had have spent more time with me in my presence. Daily disciplines, weekly habits, and finally, seasonal milestones. And I want to ask you this question. What's, what's kind of long-term for you? Like, what are you looking toward the horizon for? What are you, what are you saying? Oh, I, I can see that in the next two or three years or five years. I can see that this is going to be good for my business or my family. I, I can see this for my friendship circle. I can see that in a few years we can do this and we can do that. What, what is it that you're, you're casting your eyes toward that's beyond just the current here and now? And, and what are you doing to, to move towards that? You know, are you the kind of person that wants to invest into, into studying or learning new skills or, or, or building something fresh in your life? You know, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, I, I, I say this to some people and they kind of think, oh, well, I'm old. So, you know, why, why would I look toward the horizon when I'm, you know, I'm nearly 100, as we heard from the front row earlier. Well, looking at the horizon isn't about you. <laughs> Because you could be looking toward the horizon of your children or the horizon of your children's children or your children's children's children. So come on, when you look toward the seasonal milestones, it's not just about the seasonal milestones of your life. It's how can I empower and how can I uh, encourage and invest into the generations to come? Do I, am I the kind of leader that looks beyond myself into the future of not just my destiny, but the destiny of the generations to come? Seasonal milestones. That's kingdom leadership. Have you got a project to build? And finally, have you got a relationship to grow? Who are you mentoring or who's mentoring you? Have you got long-term, meaningful relationships that you're, that you're investing into over the long haul? You know, accountability relationships for pressure points in life, the pressure points of lust, greed, addiction, apathy, have you got people that are calling you up to your best? And are you a person that's a safe place to be encouraging that for others? These kinds of relationships are probably not just going to be week to week or month to month. They're going to be year on year, seasonal milestones. You know, you should be wary of the leader who only ever has new friends. <laughs> Come on, it, you should be cautious of a leader who's doesn't sort of have anyone who's in their corner that's a lot older than them and has been with them for decades. Who's your long-term companion? Not just your partner, but who's speaking into you, mentoring you, encouraging you over the long haul. And that other, uh, that other thought about seasonal milestones and relationships, it's also about celebrating long-term relationships, celebrating well, celebrating anniversaries and birthdays and years of serving the kingdom, years of being a a follower of Jesus. You should be celebrated. Anybody in the room here has been following Jesus for more than five years? Just raise your hand. You've been a Jesus follower for more than five years? Anyone here in the room been a Jesus follower for more than 10 years? Put your hand in the air. Anyone here in the room been a Jesus follower for more than 20 years? Put your hand in the air. All right. Now, if you don't have your hand in the air, give those guys a round of applause because we're here because they're here. Celebrate seasonal milestones. Good leaders celebrate the things that matter. And I want to conclude by going back to that, that first verse from 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, verse 1. Paul to the church in Corinth. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The most important thing in this season to lead like Jesus is to know Jesus. And what we're going to do right now, I'm going to invite you to respond to this invitation to make a commitment to Jesus Christ if you've never done so before. And after I do that, I'm also going to invite everyone else to make a fresh commitment to Jesus, to, to begin to follow Him in a way that allows Him to touch those things in your heart that need to be addressed so that you can be the best leader that you can be, the best parent, best mother, father, the best brother, sister, the best grandparent, great grandparent that you can be for the sake of those who you're leading. So with every head bowed, every eye closed in this room, if you have never committed your life to Jesus, if you've never said yes to follow Jesus before, I want to give you an opportunity right now to allow Jesus to begin to lead your life into everything that he has for you, for your family, and for what you will in turn lead. So if that's you, just raise your hand now. Online, you can let us know you're responding to this invitation. If that's you. And while we're in this holy moment, 
I want every person in this place to consider how different their leadership life might be if they were to follow in the footsteps of Jesus afresh every day, if they were to lead their own life well every day, if they were to just test the waters of their leadership every day by looking around, and if they're willing to just do the work every day, daily, weekly, and seasonally, just to to be the very best that God's called them to be, not just for themselves, but for all those they're leading. If that's you in this room, I just get a sense that God wants to just bring encouragement into your situation. He wants to show you that your season ahead in your leadership world, again, whether it's your family, your workplace, your school, your business, whatever, wherever you find yourself, that it's going to be the most influential, the most effective season that you've ever led through. And you're going to stand out above the crowd because you're going to be coming up against the culture of this world. It's going to look unusual. It's going to look different. It's going to, it's going to be confrontational. It's going to be contradictory. But I just get a sense that as you begin to sail into those headwinds, you'll stand out among your peers and you'll stand out among those who are trying to lead alongside you. You'll be the model. You'll be the example because the kingdom model is better than all others. So if that's you, as we pray this prayer together, I want this fresh commitment to follow Jesus to be one that just permeates your whole life and your leadership season to come. So come on, church. Why don't you pray this prayer after me? Jesus, this is my decision. Today, I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, let me lead like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, church.